Uh, we've sent out a couple of human signposts and a human sheepdog to help to round people up, anyone who's left, and, and guide them on their way. It reminded me a little bit uh, coming here this morning like one of those scenes in The Lord of the Rings where you're tunneling through a mountainside past strange artifacts of different civilizations and, uh, uh, and, and in danger of losing your way and, and turning into a skeleton over a long time. So I hope no one, uh, no one has that experience this morning. Uh, congratulations to those of you who managed to find your way here through through all of the obstacles that we've managed to put in your way for what we hope will be a very interesting a colloquium on perspectives on the use of remote sensing in plant health. I will just say a few words about uh, EPO um, because uh, it's hosted by EPO and Eufresco. Um, EPO is the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, an intergovernmental organization founded in 1951 for the protection of plants against pests, uh, particularly regulated quarantine pests where we are looking for outbreaks uh, to eradicate them. And one of the key constraints is the difficulty of early detection of, of pests. Uh, and that's one uh, focus of the work that our member countries, uh, member organizations uh, do, and I think is reflected in the interest in, in this subject. So uh, that's European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, EPO. We host a network of phytosanitary research funders and managers called Eufresco, which is led by Balisera Giovanni down there. Who will wave? <laughs> My name is Martin Ward. Um, but for chairing the meeting, I'd like to hand over to uh, Toby Clark from URIS, who will uh, probably explain better than I can what his organization does in the way of coordination in a very different field, uh, but a field whose interaction with our own field of work is really the subject of, of today's meeting. So I'll hand over to Toby, and I'm going to have the pleasure of sitting down there today so that I don't have to turn my head around uh, in order to look at the screen. So you're very welcome and very pleased that you've been able to come and, and lead us through the colloquium today. And we look forward to hearing from you and then from the colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, um, thank you for that warm welcome. And uh, I extend a welcome to you all here this morning as well. It's nice to see a full room um, with people with beaming, smiling faces. Um, I must say, I, it was rather daunting when I was asked to come along and chair this meeting today um, because I have no connection really with your community. <laughs> Um, I don't think I know anybody in the room. Um, but then I, when I thought about it, I thought it's a challenge that, that I should come along and, and, and listen, because I come from an organization called Eurisi. Um, it's a, a, an association that was formed nearly 30 years ago in preparation for the International Space Year. It's the European Organization for the International Space Year, which is why it's called Eurisi. Um, and it's, the purpose then was to promote uh, the, um, the space, the, the way that space can help us in society. Now, the International Space Year has long gone, but Eurasy is still pursuing this role of what we call bridging space and society. So my role in Eurasy as, as the Secretary General of Eurasy is to, is to try and um, promote the benefits that satellite applications can bring to us in our everyday lives. And so that's why I thought, you know, when, when I was asked to come and chair this meeting today, I thought, well, of course, satellite remote sensing is, uh, is a particularly important element of remote sensing um, that, that you will be talking about today. Um, so I'm coming along here with just as much an intention of learning from you um, as, as trying to chair this meeting and, and keep it all in order. So I'm really looking forward to the, the talks we have today. Um, just an, uh, the other thing about Eurus is we're mainly, as I said, we're mainly concerned about um, promoting the benefits of satellite applications. So very quickly, that is broadly in three areas. It's satellite navigation, and you will know that through the GPS, Galileo, the global navigation satellite systems. Um, it's through telecommunication. It's through bringing communication networks to remote parts of the world via satellite links. And the, the third area, which is probably the most 
um, growing area at the moment, and especially in the context of Europe with the Copernicus program of the European Commission, is Earth observation. And there's a, a lot of tremendously exciting research going on in, into how Earth observation can help us in our daily lives. Um, and, of, of course, a lot of this research is leading towards practical applications. So that is what Eurasy um, um, is doing. And I've brought along a few leaflets, which I'll leave in a strategic place, about our current program, which is called uh, Space for Cities. And, I mean, I know that's not got much to do with um, plant health, but uh, we're currently running a program on how satellites can help cities provide better environments for us to live in, given that more than, eight, I think, 85% of the world's population live in cities, and how can satellites um, help that? And I'm sure, actually, there, there may be one or two areas where you know, um, green, the green areas in cities are particularly important for city management, and the health of plants in green areas, um, I think, is particularly important. So, actually, I'm going to be um, listening with, a, with a, a keen ear today to see if there's any way that we can connect what, I, what we hear today with our program of Space for Cities. And uh, if any of you have any questions about Eurasy, then I invite you, of course, to contact me or, or look at our website um, later on. Um, so now I think we will move ahead. I think I understand that many of you were here yesterday as part of the EPO administrative meetings, and you've been sitting doing lots of, um, well, I wouldn't use the word boring, but I mean, it's not really exciting, is it? And uh, today should be the opportunity to, to, to get back to doing some real science and hearing about the exciting work um, that, that is going on. Uh, I understand most of the people here are, are from the EPO community or have been participating in that, but I would like to um, just note that there are some other organizations who have, who have expressed an interest and are uh, present here today. We have um, representation from 2XL Aviation from the United Kingdom. Um, we have the um, representation from the European Commission the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council in the UK, um, and the Polish Civil Aviation Institute, and Naktunbau from the Netherlands, and the European Food Safety Authority. So uh, these organizations are participating today by, by invitation. Um, I think without further ado, then, I shall move on to the first session of speakers this morning. Uh, we have four speakers before the coffee break, um, and we will start with um, Paul Brown from FERA Science Limited. Uh, Paul, make your way up to the uh, podium, please, um, who will give us a uh, a talk entitled Remote Sensing an Overview. So I think this should be a good introduction to um, what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, if you don't mind, I shall also go and sit down and I'll try and give you a warning when you're getting close. Can everyone hear me all right? Quite like just booming across the room. Um, so I've been given the task to give you an overview of what remote sensing actually is. Um, it's always quite hard as a remote sensor to be given that task, but we'll see how we get on. So I'm Paul Brown. I'm a GI remote sensing scientist from Ferris Science Limited in the UK. Um, just give you a wee bit of background about Ferris Science Limited. Uh, we're based up in York in the UK. We are a joint venture between Capita, a private company, and the UK Government Department for the Food, Environment and Rural Affairs. And that's our location, uh, just outside about seven miles uh, north of York. And we have quite a high remit of doing research in, plant, in the plant health area, of which remote sensing is one of those areas. So let's move into the what is remote sensing. So when I was asked to do this presentation, I obviously Googled it, like a lot of you probably have done before this, but a nice term is 
remote sensing is the acquisition of information about an object, area, or phenomenon without physical contact. Technically, we're all remote sensing now, and our sensors are the eyes, and you're all remote sensing me. But when you Google remote sensing, you come up with these quite nice diagrams, and there's, there's two general areas of remote sensing. So there's a passive system and an active system. So this is remote sensing users using a passive sensor system. So in this system, the sun is our source of electromagnetic energy, and we're detecting the reflected, um, irradiant, uh, uh, reflected radiation of objects in the Earth's uh, surface. And in this case, um, the sensor is a satellite system. So it's detecting that radiation and then beaming that data back down to the ground station. In an active system, the other system of remote sensing, the sensor is also the source of the electromagnetic radiation. So it sends out a beam of um, sort of radar data, for example, and then detects that backscatter and builds up an image using that backscatter. And then again, beams it back to the ground station or downloads the data. So they are two general systems of remote sensing. So where is remote sensing used? Um, remote sense, remotely sensed data is often captured as images, can then be analyzed to extract additional valuable data, benefiting services such as disaster control, uh, security, land management, agriculture, and forestry. We're obviously concerned about plant health, so agriculture and forestry, uh, forestry are what we're mainly going to be talking about today, as well as uh, a bit of land management. Quick example of a freely available satellite data over the Yorkshire Wolds. A classic remote sensing skill would be to classify data and extract data from that image. So if we wanted to know exactly what crop is growing in each individual field, we develop an algorithm that automatically um, trains on that spectral data from the image, we run the algorithm, and we have a general remote sensing classification telling you what crop is growing in each individual field across that area. So moving into platforms and sensors, you know, what tools do we have as a remote sensor available to us? What are the tools of the trade? So we have satellite platforms that we heard a little bit about earlier. We've got traditional manned aircraft, and more and more recently over the past sort of five years, uh, the use of uh, unmanned aerial system technology, you'll hear UAS, UAV, and drones to describe these systems. But they're taking a lot more precedence in the, in the arena at the moment. So again, just looking at the a classification example of a project from a satellite platform, freely available data, this is from the Sentinel-2 satellite, just in the top left-hand corner there. If we move on to example project using a manned platform, so this was looking at the spread of a disease in coastal Mozambique, so it's coconut lethal yellowing disease. It was decimating palm, palm plantations. And this is a photo interpretation technique. So we have a temporal sequence of data from 2008 to 2014. And these are, if you like, mega quadrats. So we're looking at over the exact same area during that time period. We had a control and a treatment area. So there's an area where the disease had just been left to its own devices. And then there was an area where um, a treatment regime had been put in place. So when one of these trees shows symptoms, the tree is felled and the wood is burnt. So this is in the control area. So you can see from 2008 to 2012, there's a, there's a decrease in palm population. And actually in 2013 and 14, the vegetation here isn't palm. It's actually been replaced by uh, different vegetation. So it's been a total decimation of coconut in that area. When we look at the treatment area, you can see the palm population across that same time course set of data is, um, is remaining relatively stable. We can then quantify that. Red is the treated, green is the controlled. And you can see the treatment regime is having a positive effect. The population is remaining relatively stable, whereas in the control area, it's, it's decreasing. So the treatment regime is having a positive effect on um, decreasing the effects of this particular disease. So moving on to uh, UAVs, drones, um, we've been using those a lot more recently over the past three and a half years at Ferra. This is just an example data set that I use for presentations. Things we can do, we can look at individual fields, and we'll be talking a lot more about vegetation indices later, but it basically gives you um, an idea of crop vigor. And this particular field is a wheat crop at early stage crop emergence. Green is basically good, red is, is bad. The, crop, the area of red down the left-hand side is more likely down to a compaction of the soil when farm machinery is uh, turning in the field. But we've also got a area of stress here, so we could probably infer that there's an entrance here where machinery is going in and out. But we can't take that on face value. We have to interrogate all the data we get as a remote sensor. 
So from the drone data, we also get 3D models that we can create uh, photogrammetrically. And these are just examples of those 3D models. You can actually see our truck just there. And then we can model the drainage patterns in that area. And there is actually no access point there. This is a significant amount of drainage is coming through this field and that area stresses due to water stress. So you're just looking at all the data and building up the picture of what is actually going on is very important in remote sensing. So moving on to some more specific case studies, some more projects we've worked on. Uh, this is an inspection targeting study. So this is, again, it's a, a classification, but in this case it's a tree species classification. So it's using very similar techniques to the crop classification. Um, and the idea was to, to identify where possible host species are to target inspections on the ground. So this is a drone image of a forest. If, if there's a pest and disease outbreak in this forest, traditionally inspectors would go there and they would look for possible host species just literally on the ground looking for those species. If we can classify that data and build an individual species classification, so down to the individual tree level, we also can derive the health of the forest, but we'll learn a lot more about that later on today. Then we can produce these target maps. So, for example, if the host species in this case was larch, then we can produce these target maps highlighting where the larch is in this forest and therefore um, focusing inspections more in a more targeted and efficient manner and then delivering that data, not via paper maps, via phones, via tablets, via GPS devices, so you can see your location as you're actually going to the field. Remote sensing is intrinsically linked with geographical information systems, so it's all about data and space and location and where, what is going on where. So moving on to another case study. Uh, so counting is quite a, a Thing that's developed recently in the remote sensing community in tree counting and crop counting. This particular study is uh, looking at automatic, automatic crop counts and health analysis during early stage crop emergence of a potato crop. So the grower, the farmer in this case, wants to understand whether, whether he was um, reaching his planting densities, his targets. So brought us in as a research project to see whether it would be possible to do this from uh, drone-derived data. So we use an object orientated uh, methodology. So what that means is you get the zoomed in image, basically put a very fine segmentation over that image. So what we're looking for is areas of similar spectral response. So a green plant coming through a brown soil is, is an area of similar spectral response. So automatically draw an object around that, that plant. We can then strip away all the objects that we don't want. So we remove all the soil. And so we're left with one object per plant and then export that as a point file. So we've got a point per plant, and we can also attribute that with its, uh, its uh, vegetation index values, its photosynthetic activity, so we can see areas where individual plants are doing well and where they're not doing so well. It has to be taken a little, with a little bit of pinch and salt, the health analysis here, because it is very early stage crop emergence, and it could just be different development stages at that stage. However, we can then look at the picture of the health analysis over the, the field in a more general manner, so we can see this area is doing a, a lot better than these areas. And then just here, there's a line where it's, there's, there's a difference in the health. And that's actually when we went to present this to the farmer. It's, a, it's different varieties of potatoes. So we're actually diff picking up the differences in different varieties in that particular area. And this is how we deliver the data. So it's just um, nowadays we don't deliver the data as a sort of raw files to sort of uh, inspectors, farmers, and users. It's delivered as a URL, a web application that allows the user to interrogate that data in, in a very limited training, sort of five, ten minutes training. The farmer is able to use this data himself without the remote sensing GIS knowledge and without the expensive software that goes with it. So I speak a lot about drone data, but obviously we're going to be speaking about satellite data in this Copernicus program in Europe. The Sentinel series of satellites is extremely important. So. Drone data, in, when we look at tree species classification, crop counting is very good because it's very fine spatial resolution. It's very detailed information. But it can only look at areas that are quite small, sort of a single woodland, 30 hectares of field. So we're not able to extrapolate. Um, it will take, so, take a very long time to fly a lot of forestry with a drone. So what we're trying to do is use the drone data to train the satellite data. So what we have here is a species classification, so these are, there's a large plantation down here. 
the grid over the top, each one of those grid squares represents a single Sentinel-2 pixel. So that's the size of the pixel, what the pixel sees on the ground. It's called the spatial resolution or the ground sample distance. And it's 10 by 10 meters in Sentinel-2, so it's not able to resolve an individual tree. So what we can do is we can resolve individual trees in the drone data because it's like 10 centimeter resolution. So we can look at pixels. If we take this under this large plantation, there's pixels in there that are probably going to be the proportion of large is about 80% and then a bit of shadow, sort of 20%. And then we can, we can tease out that spectral signature in the satellite imagery. We can understand the signature for large. And then we can go beyond this area, searching for that signature and classifying as such. So the result of that is you get proportion maps. So you get species proportion maps. So this is a proportion map for large over that area. So these are the proportions we directly took out of the drone data. So this is, the, this is what we know is there. We then strip the, the Sentinel-2 image that we used to train here and put a new image in and then run a machine learning random forest algorithm over that area and we can see that it's spatially detecting where the locations of those trees are remarkably well. It's slightly underestimating the proportions because red is sort of 75 to 100 percent whereas it's slightly underestimating but we are working on a lot larger project at the moment where we're classifying seven woodlands in an area of the UK and then we're trying to get a species classification over a whole sentinel scene, so 290 by 290 kilometers. So try to upscale from these drone <coughs> classifications to the, using the sentinel series of satellites. And then there's the example for ash. It's quite a good one because it's not as prevalent in that woodland, but it is still picking up the spatial location. So moving to remote sensing and plant health, the sort of term we're coming to terms with at the moment is the research and operational gap in plant health. So this is a, this is a statement I get quite a lot when I give presentations. Um, is remote sensing has been promising a lot for years but is yet to deliver. So my response is globally remotely sensed data is being used considerably in the classification of species and the study of plant health. Multiple studies have been conducted and identified how useful remote sensing can be for plant health. We are understanding how useful this, this um, area is. They're often, these studies, however, are often bespoke or proof-of-concept pilot studies at the moment. Only a small number of these have bridged that research and operational gap. So that is an area that we are working on, is bridging this research and operational gap. So with the new, increasingly cheaper technology coming online, operational applications are not far away. We are working on them like the species classification, extrapolate that over wider areas, that should hopefully be delivered over a sentinel scene in 2019. So we are getting there with, the, with building these operational applications. The remote sensor community are working on developing methods to use more expensive data sets to highlight the spectral areas that can be used to train these freely available satellite data. And the freely available data has become a lot more readily available. Um, it's a great time to be a remote sensor over the a lot more readily available over recent years. This, for example, we're going to be talking about a lot, the Sentinel series of satellites are part of the EU, EU Copernicus program. And to highlight that, I just uh, got this graph of um, timelines of satellite sensors relevant for remote sensing of vegetation. So here we go from 1970 all the way to 2025, and we can see sort of the, the, the Landsat series, the US missions of satellites online in this area, but then you hit the year 2000, there's suddenly an influx of a lot more systems available. These up here tend to be more commercial satellites, so it's quite expensive data. These, you can here see the Sentinel satellites, the Landsat, this is freely available data. So we are entering an era, and in the future, coming 2015 onwards, we're entering an era of a lot more data availability for these applications. So yeah, the era of plant health remote sensing is what we're getting into and as, as I think it's a golden era and it's a great time to be a remote sensor, remote sensor in this industry. Um, so we have new technology, we have a lot more data available to us, um, processing power is getting stronger and stronger, it still is an area that I think needs to keep a bit more pace with the data volumes as trying to process that data. Uh, Analysis algorithms, there's multiple analysis algorithms being developed, and obviously machine learning techniques like the random forest classifiers are being developed um, across 
the right sense of community and plant health. I'll just finish on an image of us using a, a, a drone for the species classification carrying a hyperspectral camera. And it just, I think this depicts collaboration is key in this area. Because as myself actually taking this picture, colleagues from Ferris Science Limited, colleagues from RAL Space in the UK and colleagues from Newcastle University, flying a ferro drone with a RAL Space camera. So it's all about collaboration in this arena so we can achieve what we want to achieve. So to end on, I really hope you enjoy the day and uh, we hear a lot of interesting stuff about remote sensing and plant health. Thank you very much. Um, I think we, what we will do is we have a, a discussion session after the coffee break. If there's one quick question now we could take. Um, doesn't look like it. The only question I have very quickly though is yeah. the, the example you gave of um, the, looking at the crop counting yeah. in the field. Is that a research project or is that um, it, yes, available it was, to farmers? It was for a grower so it was a research project for a farmer and it is available. The algorithm's there. But to crack the farming market, you almost have to put the, this drone data, you almost have to put the drone and the sensor in the farmer's hand. Yeah. It costs a lot of money to get a surveyor in to do all that sensing. And then the idea is to get that drone and sensor in the farmer's hand. It's easy to fly, easy to program, program to his farm, upload that data to the cloud, and it comes back with his results. That's when you're going to crack that sort of market, as it were. Okay. But that's also something we're working on, is developing cheaper, lightweight sensors that can go on cheap, lightweight drones. Okay, thank you. No, I think we will, and probably uh, I suspect in the discussion, we will focus a little bit on, on the barriers to the successful uptake to this technology, because that's something that I, um, in Eurasy, that we are always trying to focus on, is how we can, we can really encourage the, the, the take-up of the, the, the research projects into uh, useful applications. So, now, our second speaker this morning, then, um, um, is Angela Lausch uh, from the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. Uh, where is that in Germany? In Germany, in Leipzig. In Leipzig. Mm. And um, she is going to give us a talk on understanding forest health by remote sensing. much. <clears throat> I will speak about understanding for ourselves by remote sensing and I will give this presentation as a biologist to show uh, <clears throat> you how the pattern and process interaction or the stress or how remote sensing can measure stress stress in, <clears throat> in deep. We have different platforms. We talk <clears throat> about spacebound up to uh, URV, and I wrote uh, many papers about that <clears throat> as a biologist, how we can understand the processes or see the processes <coughs> and the uh, and, um, <coughs> traits, and I will give you some impression of that. When we speak about forest health, and we know that <clears throat> we have different systems that we have to, to integrate this health system on different levels of biotic organization, this starts from gene up to landscape, and here I have an overview of what we have to, to, to integrate in, in, in our analysis. We have not only to integrate um, the, the landscape level, we have to start from the gene up to the landscape level, and we have to, to understand the phylogenetic or the phylogenetic stress of a plant, the taxonomic stress or changes of them, the structural changes in stress, and also the functional stress of the vegetation. So that it is really a, a huge amount of indicators what we have to collect, and so we have to to think about how remote sensing can help us in this process. Here you have this an overview a little bit in deeper that uh, how we can uh, measure. Um, um, stress by remote sensing approach. It's a little bit difficult, this, this uh, image. But you have to see, uh, you see that when you measure uh, stress in vegetation, then, then um, 
we have different approaches how we can measure this and important is that we have a trade approach and this is what I will go in deeper to explain how can help trade the trade approach to understand process and pattern interaction for remote sensing. Here you see also the, the question how can remote sensing measure stress and disturbances in forest or in ecosystems and in plants. And what we saw that uh, remote sensing can measure uh, reflection, absorption, and surface, and what on. What, what is important is that remote sensing can record traits and trait variation. And this is the basis of my speaking. What are traits and what is the trait concept of, spe of species? Plant traits are anatomical, morphological, biochemical, physical, structural, or phenological characteristic of plants, population, or communities. What is this? <clears throat> Traits are, an ex example, the flower, the color of the flower, or the flower shape is in trait, or the leaf of the shape is in, in trait, or the leaf morphology, or the growing characteristics are traits. This is really important, this plant trait concept from basic of a biologist. And this trait concept help us to allow it to go a completely new way in understanding the question of biodiversity and also of stress. Traits help us why organisms live where they do and how they will respond to environmental change. And how they interact to different stresses or disturbances or resource limitation and drivers. <laughs> so ecologists are increasingly looking at traits rather than species in the same to measure the health of the ecosystem. That means that traits are really indicators for stress and disturbances. Here you have a simple example or <clears throat> an image how we can understand this. Traits are the filter for stress and processes. Here you have an, a forest, a simply <clears throat> image of a forest, and you see the, the infection of bark beetles is, is one driver for changing traits, and we have an, a change in trait that it's changed the chlorophyll content, the water content of the tree, and this is what a remote sensing sensor can measure. You measure the change of the traits depend on the driver, or when you have harvesting here, then you have other structural information of this that we can measure, also when you have um, <coughs> the buildings or whatever. Here you have a more complex information that processes lead to changes in traits and trade variation. Here we have the process of land use intensity, land use intensity or forest intensity change, species composition and uh, <coughs> biochemical composition of, of, the of the trees. And this is what we can measure inside of uh, or in or by remote sensing. Here, this is the space borne up to the wireless sensor that does not depend on the sensor. It's really important that remote sensing can measure traits and these changes. Here you have the same <coughs> information, but only here. Here you have small um, yeah, trees to, uh, and changes of the spectral traits by them, so that we have really a change of this. Uh, biochemical or structural uh, changes. And this is really important that you understand this principle of changes. Remote sensing can enable, we have in our research center, we have a hyperspectral sensor, and uh, this is a an, an, an summary of all the traits or all the information uh, who the hyperspectral remote sensing can measure. This are exa the example of them that we can measure biochemical, biophysical uh, traits that can be chlorophyll content or carotenoid or xanthophyll protein, nitrogen, phosphor, cellulose, oil, water, or, or so on. And when you are not able to measure this biochemical characteristic, then, you cannot able, then we are not able to, to measure the specific stress uh, Example is metal or whatever. You cannot measure directly by remote sensing this, this element. When we look on, on this uh, completely interaction of, of the diversity or of the stress <coughs> indicators, here some examples 
that uh, we are able more and more to, to analyze with remote sensing phylogenetic stress in, in plants or in, in forest or in vegetation. It means that based on phylogenetic or epigenetic processes, we have different elements in plants which we, are, which we are able or other people are able to measure by remote sensing, especially mostly the hyperspectral sensor who is able. Here's an important example from Craig Astner. He is really important in, in this field of, of research. And he showed us that we can really measure elements based on, on the genetic information of the, of the plants and we can create forest functional diversity or, or analyze the changes of the, of the genetic information by epigenetic processes and stress and disturbances. Here, the next um, example is that we can measure really easy or we can measure taxonomic stress or disturbances or uh, we can make classification of tree species. And this is the basis why we can measure or distinct uh, trees. Um, here we have um, <clears throat> different traits or we can uh, distinct uh, species when their traits are different. The traits are different when we have different leaf shapes or flower shapes or colors. And that when we have different biochemical traits, then we are able to measure that. So that remote sensing can measure really taxonomic traits. Here also an example of that, that we can classify uh, different species uh, by remote sensing. This classification is really depend on the traits of the this, of this species and depend on the sensor which we, we used. And another example that we can measure not only plant species itself, also communities and so on. And this is the same basic that when the, when the community is, is um, <clears throat> different in traits, then we can measure this by remote sensing. The next uh, example is how we can measure structural or functional diversity. Here is a really easy uh, <clears throat> A process that we have the process of um, a fire here that changed traits that, that we have really um, traits <clears throat> and so here trait variation means that we have an, an changing in water content or chlorophyll content or structural changes so that we can measure really this healthy or this disturbed um, <clears throat> tree by remote sensing. There exists a lot of examples of that for fire um, <clears throat> estimation by remote sensing, um, by Landsat TM, Sentinel, and so on, and also from local to global, because we have so much, a huge amount of, of remote sensing information that we are really able to really fast detect uh, fire estimation of fire in the ground or in the forest. The next example is that we can really, <clears throat> or remote sensing can good measure long-term deforestation or fragmentation. This is really a good application also in, in global scale that we are able in, um, <clears throat> or that sensors or we are able to, to monitor this information, give this um, for politics to, to do something. What is with the structural information that we are able not only in 2D to measure information, that's an example of forest in Australia with LiDAR scanning, that we have really the information of 3D um, forest. And when we go a little bit deeper and coupling data together, here's an example from Michael Chapman from Zurich. He is really famous in and also in this uh, topics, when we coupling laser scanning data and testicle laser scanning, we got more and more information of this of this um, <laughs> um, configuration of a tree or a forest. An example for disturbances by bark beetle or the beetle infection is the same thing that we have a spectral traits of the forest and we have a process bark beetle infection and change traits so that we can measure that. 
And this is the same situation that we have really the possibility by hyperspectral remote sensing data or Sentinel-2 data really fast or also uh, <clears throat> yeah, to monitor this uh, infection and give an overview, let's end, how we able to do this. There exists a lot of yeah, examples in references or in, in literature to, to do this and to integrate this in, in your monitoring process for forest. We are really able also to, to measure functional diversity or the, the modification of, of plant species composition by land use intensity or forest intensity. We know that forest intensity changed the, the composition of the, of the plant species so that we're able to, to, to analyze the, the changes of the composition of the species itself. And this helped us to, to have a better look on, on here you see in, um, that um, the changes of the species to, to other strategy types, plant strategy types, who, who are depend on the stress or on the, on the effect on, on, on our landscape. And this is what we can, the effect of this um, drivers we can measure really. Here you have an example uh, for functional diversity, how we can measure this by, by uh, remote sensing. Here you have, um, this I have to explain a little bit in more detail, that it's, it's from a working group from Michael Chapman and, and it's, it's, it's um, published in Nature Communication. It's really important, this, this paper, because this, this analysis was, uh, was did by hyperspectral remote sensing information, and we we had not um, or in this in this uh, analysis we did not integrate any body of in situ measurements, so that this is only in, in project by remote sensing or airborne remote sensing itself. You you integrate in this index or to measure diversity or functional diversity to indicate more uh, morphological forest traits. Here, plant area index or canopy high or <coughs> high diversity, and additional also physiological forest traits, border thickness, carotenoids, or chlorophyll contents. And in the end of, of such a measuring, you, you create an evenness index, a morphological evenness index, who gives us more an information about the functionality or the diversity and, and, and monitoring or the changes of the, the functional diversity itself. And this is really one, only one example of, of the good examples who we are able to, can, <coughs> you, we can measure photosynthetic activity, chlorophyll content, what, whatever, or a lot of them. One example can be uh, that we have the measuring or above ground carbon density for a region. There are integrated a lot of indicators who are <coughs> summarized uh, in the end of this uh, final <coughs> indicators to, to say or to, to find uh, information about the functional diversity and the stress and the disturbances of that diversity. And in my last uh, one year ago, I, I started to think, okay, we have now a lot, a huge of, of data, a huge of sensor and whatever, and um, we have a lot of information. And what, what is required to, uh, to, to build really a good network in understanding health and so on? <laughs> and I was thinking about what is the data data science approach or what, how can help us the data science approach in understanding that. Here you have the overview of a lot or some indicators from health, for the forest health, what, can, what we have to integrate. These are the, the vegetation indicators, also the, the flora and fauna indicate the flora and fauna indicator, but we have to also to integrate apiotic, a lot of apiotic indicators from soil, from water, from, from the air, from, from really the apiotic indicators and all the processes um, which we have to focus on. 
So that the indicators is there are not really all of them. But we have to look how we can combine this indicator in, in a process that we can understand really the, the process pattern and the action from plants. And when we see this process or that, that we know that traits exist on all level of, of scale, we, start, we can start with, with information from the individual that we have chlorophyll content, can measure it from the ground up to the plot, to the local, up to the global. But we know that when we have a remote sensing sensor, a remote sensing sensor is stupid. He don't know what the reason of the process is. The reason of the process for, can be different. And this is really important that we can, that we have to, to combine long-term high-frequency uh, sensor network with long-term low-frequency air and space-borne information. So that we have to integrate in our concept really all the platforms where we can measure um, health information that start from the lab to, the <coughs> to other the echotrons <coughs> and um, the sites or the flux tower up to drones to integrate drones, microlight, airborne and spaceborne. And this is important, this coupling of the data for remote sensing for calibration and validation, that, that we start really to know, okay, this network is important, that we integrate this network on the ground for calibration and validation, not only for the drone or for airborne and spaceborne sensors, because the, the trades are, the trades <clears throat> changes really fast. We have in one year really a modification of the traits and not only from, from one driver, from different driver, from the soil, from, from the infection and whatever. What is important that we start also in thinking in, in forest or in biodiversity and in health, that we start to, to, to standardize <coughs> monitoring approaches. Here you have an overview of of the, um, the network here, uh, starting with the essential climate variables that they say, okay, which <coughs> indicators are really important to measure? Or for the biodiversity where I integrate in this community, which indicators are really important and to measure over time? Only uh, one question to data science. What is important for the future, what we have or what we're working on, is that we have now to find a way to couple not only the big data, we have, we have to couple the complex data, the different type of data what we are working on. Or <clears throat> with the semantic web helps us, semantic web, the linked open data approach to couple really data. And this is what we are um, uh, thinking about that. What is also a next step, what we have to think about is that we have to, to think about how we take our data fair. The fair principle means that the data are findable, accessible, interoperable and resuable. Oh, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> okay, and in the end, the last one is, is really important that in data science process we have to, to understand understand and to, to manage, to manage and to create a complete life cycle of the data, of the data of the processes. This started really from the sci scientific question from the sensors and so on. The data saving this uh, <clears throat> whatever, it's really a, a big process. And you have to integrate the, the data science process to couple or do you have to couple this with really um, this, the networks of, of information and this is here a really good uh, starting point for Envy Plus. Envy Plus is an organization or not an organization, it's a project in, um, <clears throat> where the people are able to, to get a connection to the networks of, of environmental information, ICOS and, and so on. And the last slide of that is only to, to give a short impression what is in, important for data science. 
data science. We have to find good indicators who describe really stress and disturbances. It's really important. The process of digitalization is important and it's, it's also going on. That means that we have big data, complex data, that we know that we have, we can only <coughs> quantify, um, yeah, quantify, or we have to use science cloud. We have to use platforms where we can manage big data and, 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 and analyze this. We have to find standardization processes. We have to manage metadata. We have to go with go fair, fairness or the fair data pro, uh, approach. And we have to look that we find essential, essential variables for, for our topic. Semantification is important for linked open data, for the coupling of the data. We have to integrate machine learning, cloud computing, Hadoop, Google Engine, and so on. And what important is that we have to prove trust, to measure proof trust and certainties in our data, that we can trust this data, and trust not only in remote sensing data, trust only also in uh, data science uncertainties, but um, that we have uh, really this part in situ, who measured this information, what is the base, what is the date of the, this data, so that we have really this information. And in the end, for, for stakeholder and data manager, it's important that we give them easy software and easy platform to, to give or to make a decision. It's not able that we can give you remote sensing data or you can, down, you, you can download all the remote sensing data or, or so on, but nobody can work with this when we, you have not experience in 10 or 20 years with this data. It's really difficult. So that we need really easy software who the stakeholders, manager, politicians can create good um, decision based on this really um, um, good or uh, big data um, amount. So thank you very much for, for that. Well, thank you, Angela. That was... Um, really interesting uh, presentation and I think it, it actually confirms a lot of uh, my experience in working in Eurasy that one of the biggest barriers to the, to the real uptake of, of all of this research into operational use is the sort of easy accessibility of data and the, and the way that data is presented so that it's understandable and use, usable by the, the, the people who, to whom it really matters and I think that's something again that I would like to sort of park a little bit for the moment and we'll return to that question uh, during the discussion. Um, so we'll move on to our third talk now um, for this morning. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Peter Beck uh, from the Joint Research Centre. Where is that based? Uh, in six different places. Oh, okay. I'm in northern Italy. You're in Italy then. And the title of the talk is... Um, no, you might yes. want to bring up your slide. The title of your talk is Early Detection of Diseases in Forests and Agricultural Crops Using Advanced Aircraft-Based Imaging Principles and Case Studies. Thank you. Right. I shortened my title a bit, okay. um, but the concept stays close. So uh, I work at the Joint Research Center. We're the in-house science service of the European Commission, um, and we do policy-relevant research. Uh, I'll draw on a collaboration with uh, many, many different fellow researchers, uh, in Italy, Spain, um, in the UK, in Germany. Uh, we've received funding from the Horizon 2020 X Factors project on uh, Xalela Fastidiosa, which I'll talk a bit about, um, and from DG Sante, our colleagues uh, dealing with plant health, among other things. This is an olive tree showing uh, the early signs of infection by Xalela, and uh, recognized also in the opening text of this symposium the needle in the haystack scenario of finding these trees early is uh, critical to staying ahead of plant health, uh, plant disease epidemics. Uh, even trickier is finding these trees when they are infected, but do not show any visual symptoms yet. 
and in my talk I'll, I'll uh, go in that direction, make the distinction between detecting visual symptoms and this holy grail for remote sensing for plant health, <coughs> detecting not yet to the human eye visible symptoms through remote sensing. And I'll refer to that uh, language of plant traits uh, to, to frame that, that also Angela used. Uh, and for that needle in the haystack scenario, the question of remote sensing comes up often. Uh, the effort to survey uh, is massive. When we're surveying for non-visible symptoms, it means we rely even more on laboratory analysis, which explodes the effort even more. You know this all much better than I do, because it's not my field. Um, but then the question becomes, can remote sensing, and I'll call it here computer-aided image analysis, help in that work. My, I will tell you already my last take-home message, and that is remote sensing won't replace these other tools. It won't replace underground service. It won't replace laboratory analyses. I would argue it can help make it a lot more efficient, cost-efficient, and targeted. When we think remote sensing, when we say remote sensing, many people think of satellites. And indeed, they provide an increasing amount of information orbiting Earth. Um, they need to be shot up by rockets. But, as you've been told before, the range of platforms is expanding. Uh, anything between things carrying, carried on a satellite to sensors that you can launch in your backyard. Here, actually, the major limitation is aviation law. It's not necessarily the technology. It's, are you allowed to fly an unmanned vehicle, are we, are we sure we can do this safely? Aviation law is working to catch up with that, to also integrate that across Europe. And then there's a big field of application we often forget about in between, which is manned airborne aviation for remote sensing. And that's actually the application that has the longest history of these. Um, in the Copernicus program, it is there. It's, uh, it's a bit sidelined by the big high-profile satellite missions. Also on the sensor side, there's a huge range. So not only on the platform side, uh, uh, a Sentinel satellite might be the size of a small van, which is why it takes a big rocket to get them up there. But we now have, so this is a, a, a cartoon of a multi-spectral imager. So you see not just a red, a green, and a blue image like a standard photograph, but you'll see all these different shapes of red, all these different shapes of, of shades of green will be measured and so forth, so you might be measuring not in red, green, blue, but in 16 or so bands. You have a hyperspectral imager here that fits in the palm of your hand, with which you can measure 60, 80 of those bands. And it is those different bands of light that we can relate back to those spectral traits of leaves, of plants. I'll come back to that. So with this huge range of data options, uh, platforms, sensors, Active remote sensing, passive remote sensing, come trade-offs. Yeah? And I think that is something to, to help frame all those different angles of remote sensing. Trade-offs. For particular cases, how large is the area that you are monitoring for a plant disease? And how often do you need an updated observation? You can get satellite images of all of Europe every five minutes. That's what they use for weather forecasting. This image from uh, Meteosat 10 takes an image every 10 minutes, but it's not very useful for monitoring a crop or a plant because the spatial resolution that you get is much too coarse. You, that, those pixels that were shown earlier, they are very big, so you won't see things at the fine scale. It's a trade-off between how often, how big, how detailed. How small are the features you want to analyze? In the needle in the haystack scenario of plant health, I would argue most cases for early detection, you want to be able to see individual plants, which you won't see from Meteosat, which you won't see from Sentinel, which you will see from the air and a few um, privately run satellite sensors. This is an image from aircraft, 7 centimeter resolution. Google Earth doesn't only show you satellite data. When you zoom in, you see these kind of data from an aircraft, from a manned aircraft. You can see variation within the tree, within the crown, etc. But ultimately, in that trade-off, the question should be, what are you looking for? After all, 
when we talk about plant stress induced by diseases, pests, or abiotic factors, most of those processes are not visible. We don't see photosynthesis. We don't immediately see water stress in plants. We don't see the exchange of water and carbon dioxide between leaf tissues and the atmosphere. But that's where, when you move into this more advanced types of remote sensing beyond what your regular camera does, you can hone in on those traits and the processes underlying them. Plant physiology, uh, stomata are open to get CO2 uh, among the leaf tissue cells. As they open, plants lose water. Losing evaporating water causes evaporative cooling, just like when we sweat. If a plant is water-stressed, stomata close. That means it's probably absorbing less CO2. It's cooling less by evaporation. And a plant will heat up. It will get more sensible heat coming out. Because ultimately, the energy that comes in needs to go somewhere. This process we can see. This is a thermal image tuned to be fit for the range of surface and plant temperatures. And you see over this crop the individual plants, and you can assign and estimate for the individual plants their temperature. And this temperature can be directly related to water stress, particularly on a hot, dry day. So this is an example of how we're linking the type of remote sensing do, we're doing exactly to the physiological process that we might think is underlying stress. Stress potentially induced by pathogen. The way I like to think of all these applications is in the energy budget of a leaf. So bear with me here. This is a cross-section of a leaf. The energy the plant receives comes from the sun. So this is the incoming radiation. A part of that energy body, about a quarter, is dissipated as heat. A part goes right through. The leaf is partly transparent. Quite a lot is used for photosynthesis. It's the energy that causes the, the carbon of the atmosphere to be converted into sugars. Part is reflected. That is that passive remote sensing that Paul talked about. That's the light coming back to the sensor because it's coming from the sun, bouncing off the vegetation back to the sensor. And a very small portion is actually actively emitted by the plant as a side product of photosynthesis. We call that fluorescence. This in the satellite community is a very hot topic of research. We don't understand it completely yet, but we do know it is linked to plant stress as well. So, indicators of vegetation stress, stress often are linked to changes in transpiration, water. That ultimately impacts also CO2, because stomata close to reduce water losses. That eventually means plants can uh, do less photosynthesis. So besides effect on temperature, we can only see, also see often uh, effects of photosynthetic pigments. And we have that hyperspectral data that looks in very fine wavelengths of color. We can actually estimate concentrations of photosynthetic pigments in vegetation. Another indicator relating exactly back to a physiological process associated with stress that we can get from remote sensing. Fluorescence is that other process that we can estimate from remote sensing increasingly well now and is often a good indicator of stress. So you're noticing I'm talking about stress, as Angela did, I'm not talking about finding a particular pathogen. We are not there, and we probably won't be there anytime soon. But we're helping you, or I think remote sensing has the potential to find those plants that are struggling. And given <laughs> all what you know about the context, that might be more or less likely due to a particular pathogen. And then finally, uh, uh, sort of later on, you'll see structural changes. You'll see wilting, you'll see leaf shedding, you'll see discoloration that really reflects also the internal structure of plants. And to get a full understanding of that, we need to integrate that into physical models of how light and energy travels between plants, how that then scatters between leaves, and ultimately reaches back the sensor. I won't go too much into detail of that. So, together that gives us a suit of indicators that are really physiologically based of different stress uh, mechanisms. So we have those that are ultimately linked to things that are visual, pigment loss, loss of the carotenoids and the chlorophyll that are the workhorses of photosynthesis that will eventually be often affected during stress periods. 
We have structural error indices, that NDVI that has been talked about is partly responsive to structural changes in vegetation. Um, they can be, uh, often they are not the earliest manifestations of stress. And then we have, quite interestingly also, those pre-visual ones. So changes in other pigment cycles that respond more quickly to stress than others. Um, chlorophyll fluorescence and temperature changes related to uh, water stress. So this suit of potential indicators we put to the test in the context of Silella fastidiosa to ask if we measure these from remote sensing at the right scale at the right time, can we actually inf discriminate the plants that are not visually symptomatic from the ones that are visually symptomatic? And we asked, can we maybe even pick up the plants that are infected but not yet showing symptoms? using these indicators. So we did a dedicated remote sensing campaign with an aircraft twice, 2016 and 17, imaged about 200,000 trees. Um, this was led by Pablo Zarco Tejada, who at the time was at the, uh, at the Joint Research Center. He's now in Melbourne as a professor. Um, this has been published this year, and it was linked to a big field campaign, so we had the phytopathologists there ranking trees on how symptomatic are there. Part of the trees were also lab tested for, to confirm they were indeed suffering from Silella infection. We collected images at a resolution that is hyperspectral, so we see those very fine spectral response curves, but we do that for individual trees. That combination of spectral response and this level of detail, we can only get from the air. You cannot get that from any satellite. No. So based on this, we could then estimate for individual trees, pigment concentrations, fluorescence, um, other indicators associated with uh, degradation of, of uh, chlorophyll, for example, structural indices. We also had a thermal camera, so we had for every individual tree an estimate of its uh, crown temperature. Here you see some of those indicators overlaid on the trees, so we even see a bit of within crown variation. This is how it compares to the different uh, levels of severity as seen on the ground by the phytopathologist. These are asymptomatic, these are very severely affected. You see how the indicators respond differently. When we take these all together, we find that we can discriminate the symptomatic sorry, the symptomatic from the asymptomatic trees with more than 80% accuracy. So deploying the right sensor for this task, and we did it in summer when water demand is high, so if there is water stress, we will see it in the signal, allowed us, and this is probably not the best indicator, but it gives you a, a fair idea that we did a very good job on discriminating operationally on our data the symptomatic from the asymptomatic trees. But we had a very intriguing finding, which is that the trees that were visually asymptomatic, so they looked fine to the phytopathologists, but our remote sensing algorithm said these are heavily stressed. Those trees had a much higher likelihood of developing visual symptoms in the coming months because we had phytopathologists go back uh, and those trees were much more likely to be symptomatic a month, two, three months after. And that to us suggests that we are, through these measures that are um, sensitive to non-visual processes are actually picking up the not yet visible symptoms of Xylella infestation. So that was very encouraging. It's uh, published this year in Nature Plants. And it's, uh, I think, a, a good demonstration of sort of the cutting edge where we are on early detection of symptoms that might be caused by Xylella. In this case, we know it's Xylella because this area is infested. Uh, but per se, we are not attributing necessarily these symptoms to any single cause. For that, you need the lab, you need the field. We're now testing how some of those lessons learned and how much of that information we can get from satellite data. This is Sentinel-2. You see immediately that those pixels are so big, you're not going to see individual trees. You have a lot of signal here also coming from the understory, which is also changing because people are abandoning fields, there's different phenology. So we're working hard on disentangling that. But it illustrates uh, the, really the scale discrepancy between those two, those two platforms. This, however, you don't need to plan. You can get it if it's cloud-free every five days. So the two might complement each other well in terms of spatial detail and actually capturing temporal patterns. Okay. 
Now I'm going to change topic. I'm going to go away from um, early detection and uh, non-visible -vis symptoms. Uh, we did, for DG Santé, work in the Pinewood nematode buffer zone uh, uh, along the Portuguese border, where we used the mo pro probably the most standard remote sensing technology uh, to try and find trees that were obviously in, uh, in decline, because those have to be removed uh, because they're particularly susceptible to pine nematode. Uh, and we used uh, standard aerial photographs, which are collected in you know, all European countries uh, on a five-year basis or so, uh, for land cover mapping, etc. Here you see them in a color tone that you usually don't get to see because there's also near-infrared included. And we repeated slides at higher resolutions. And you can see just visually, you're picking up the dead trees here. You're picking up in yellow tones trees that are starting to wilt. You see them better here. So this is exactly the same area over a uh, three-year period, and here you see them again. For this type of analysis and for these kind of images, the whole approach I talked about is not so suitable because you don't have that spectral detail to really hone in on traits. However, um, this kind of image, you can see those trees. Yeah? And we are increasingly have... Uh, computer algorithms that mimic that. It's what Google and Facebook use to suggest you, this is a picture of your friend, this is a picture of, your, of a car. Those automatic image recognition uh, algorithms are increasingly also entering into this field. Here is an example uh, further zoomed in. So we're basically training algorithms to pick these features up rather than really linking it to physiology. Here's an example from elsewhere in the literature a similar algorithm, but made for counting mangoes. Yeah? So you see lots of these applications, and I predict you'll see more and more because these types of algorithms are now in the public domain. They're, and really, the biggest effort for these is refining and training. They're not based on physical principles. Well, they are, but not on physiological principles. What they require is lots and lots of training data, which is partly why some of these big tech giants want your pictures to train their algorithms. They want you to tell, you, tell what's in the picture, and then their algorithms can catch it. I, I predict this will move forward quite fast, and it will go beyond just detecting fruits. It will go on to detect particular disease symptoms on fruits when they are visible, for example. Um, this is a, a work also going on at GRC, where they're actually using photographs taken from a car to do crop mapping. Similar techniques. Uh, finding out what is here is not based on first principles of physiology. It's based on number crunching with huge computing volumes. If you train enough pictures, they will find that this is maze. So, four take-home messages. There's no one-size-fits-all approach for the use of remote sensing to detect disease in crops and forests. Approaches need to be tailored to, disease, to the disease system, and that understanding is critical if we want to have good results. The range of data platforms and sensors is rapidly expanding. They come with trade-offs. It requires matching processing platforms to, to handle all that data. For plant applications, there is for now a spectrum of applications <coughs> ranging from those that are grounded in plant physiology, my xylella example, which really has the benefit that it also can teach the physiologists and the pathologists. Uh, you get feedback, you get an exchange of the information that is gathered. On the other end of the spectrum, you have feature recognition and machine learning algorithm that really number crunch uh, photographs in particular. I think in the, in the future, these might meet each other, which could give uh, very exciting uh, prospects. And then finally, what I said earlier, remote sensing won't replace other diagnostic tools anytime soon, um, particularly not in plant health but I believe it holds the potential to make the monitoring more efficient, more cost-efficient, if it is wisely deployed as a complement of other inspection and testing methods. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, again, very thought-provoking, um, interesting discussion. I'm sure that will uh, lead into the discussion that we will have after the coffee break. And then we will uh, move up to the coffee break. We'll finish with our fourth talk this morning uh, from um, Anna Maria Dongia um, from C-I-H-E-A-M. What is that? Kiam. Kiam. Uh, also in Italy. 
the application of remote sensing for the official monitoring of citrus tristeza virus and xylella fastidiosa. Okay, so I thank my previous speakers because they make easier my talk. And uh, I want just before to, to start uh, on, uh, on my presentation, I want to show you that the Institute is in the south of Italy and is an international organization. And uh, we focus attention also on integrated pest management with uh, education, private research, international cooperation, networking. And uh, we, our target is to raise awareness on phytosanitary emergencies in the UMED region. So this is our target. But we also play another role, not only international, but also local. Uh, we provide technical support to, our, um, to the Apulian Regional Plant Protection Service in pest monitoring. <laughs> Sorry, in pest monitoring. And uh, we have uh, uh, done this for several, uh, we, we are doing because it's uh, an annual monitoring. Of course, the last one, the most fastidious one is Xylella fastidiosa. But uh, during uh, our um, more than 30 years of collaboration, of course, uh, we are inspectors. So we fill the problems of inspectors, and uh, so we try to make operational also very easy tools that can uh, facilitate the work of inspectors. So as for uh, remote sensing, uh, we started uh, uh, several approaches uh, since uh, more than 10 years uh, on c 2 tristeza virus, and uh, which is the first uh, uh, approach we did um, because there is a citrus growing area and uh, of course uh, the, the, the citrus infected trees uh, by Tristeza may not show really symptoms necessary and uh, of course this is the, the clear decline, quick decline, but maybe chlorotic so you can really do not know if they are infected or not before they have a decline. And so they are of course vector transmitters so the spread is very fast and uh, you don't know if uh, it occurs or not. So it's, um, it was very important uh, to guide the inspections of the survey in a more target way. And uh, so um, to early detect the infection in CTV-free areas, I mean, try to inspect sites which are where the most suspected and to eradicate contained virus spread that penalize partial and temporal distribution of the infection. So, uh, in this context, the first approach, which was already also uh, presented, is, was to use pure isolates of a CTV, that of course we have it because we are also a quarantine center, and uh, try to analyze it by the spectral point of view. So to distinguish inoculated plant from not inoculated plant in, uh, we say, controlled conditions first. And then we, we went to the field with the spectral radiometer and we tried to see, of course, uh, by detecting the trees of the infection first. And uh, so we could uh, discriminate between CTV infected and not infected trees and uh, try to focus the attention on, uh, sorry, yeah, on this part of the spectral uh, wavelength. And uh, specific vegetation indices were uh, selected, and uh, on that time, GOI-1 and World V2 were the two satellites uh, uh, which were used for combining, for relating ground sensor data set and satellite data set. So uh, an algorithm recognition for CTV was developed, and uh, a synthetic image was developed in order to produce, to develop um, what we could say a prediction map. So in this prediction map, in reality, we have uh, some red spots which are um, uh, indicating the possibility to find in a, in a free area the problem. So where to search first? And of course, uh, our situation is very complicated. We have a very fragmentation of uh, the, um, the owners, I mean, of the single grove. So we need also to find the single uh, grove where to go for inspector. So we, we use all these tools in order to, uh, this is the area, sorry, the south of Italy. So uh, this is uh, the infected area. This is, was the area which was considered still 
uh, free and it was uh, uh, important for inspectors to investigate soon in order to see if the, the infection reached the area. So thanks to the processing by multispectral image, uh, we could, um, this is the infected area, we could identify new infected foci using the prediction maps. Of course, uh, not all the spots were CTV, but uh, uh, at least we found two new foci, and others, of course, were due to other problems, uh, like Fusarium phytophthora, mainly phytophthora, and so, in order to uh, improve the algorithm for recognition, uh, so we, we, we did uh, the same approach, but using the two uh, agents, always in greenhouse conditions with pure isolates culture. So in order to see if there was a discrimination among uh, the two pathogens, and in reality there was, so this is the healthy, this is the phytophthora, this is the tristeza. So this could give us uh, the possibility to improve the algorithm and to be more accurate. Of course, uh, again, uh, we are not uh, um, uh, still in, the, um, in a step in a phase that we say, oh, uh, this is a tristeza again, but at least uh, we uh, will exclude uh, uh, symptoms, uh, I mean, uh, diseases which may have a similar uh, behavior. And um, always to make easier, the work of uh, MPPO, I mean uh, the region, the, the, the Apulian PPO, MPPO, um, we thought uh, to uh, also try to set up a tree algorithm in order to quantify uh, the, the trees uh, that we were going to inspect. And so to organize the work uh, before the survey campaign. And this is very important because uh, the organization, I mean, as I think uh, all MPPOs here knows that uh, the problems are human resources <laughs> and uh, many things in the organization. So to do everything before to start, uh, to organize uh, materials uh, and uh, um, the, all the inspections uh, is very important. And uh, so this was a good tool for this purpose. And um, for example, we could also, um, uh, on the, on using the same tool, also um, soon after detection, select the, I mean, see, visualize the infected trees on the field, and it was also very important to um, evaluate the sampling method. For example, this is the sampling method for Tristeza, which is a hierarchical sampling, and this is the method uh, which uh, was uh, is used for uh, by the decree, and uh, we could uh, using the these methods, so entering here or entering from this side, we could evaluate also the sampling scheme directly on the, on the, in the field and also uh, size and the number of samples and everything. So this was very effective in the organization of the work, of the field work. But uh, as I said, it was certain in 2010, so, and then of course it was improved this, this year, so this is already in the routine. But, um, but we had this problem in 2013 of uh, the Xylella fastidiosa, so uh, we had to do something, again, to facilitate the first hour work, because we were involved in the inspections again, analysis, so uh, we thought that uh, it was very important to soon uh, use a very simple uh, um, uh, tools, and uh, you know, Xylella is quite different from the C. tristeza virus, I mean, there we were searching for citrus, so it's much more easier to um, also to have it because we had also the situation of the citrus growth, so everything was much easier to apply on a large scale. Now, uh, Foxylella, in reality, okay, the primary host is, uh, olive, is the olive trees in Apulia, but in reality we had uh, so many hosts, sorry, so many hosts and so many um, uh, Yes, um, and that was also symptomless uh, in most of the cases because not all plants were symptomatic. So um, many problems, but mainly the number of host species. So we had to rely first on, uh, on olive trees because uh, uh, that was uh, the main host and also considering that Apulia is, uh, there is an homogeneous cover of olive uh, trees, uh, as you see the green here. So it's uh, one pathway for the, for the pathogen. 
And uh, so, but how to, to start the, the monitoring in a more efficient way and uh, start, starting to be more accurate? <coughs> so we were, of course, always relying on remote sensing data, uh, even using RGB uh, image, uh, but we were combining also the IT tools for um, uh, um, identifying these trees which were suspected uh, using an application for field data acquisition, and we combine also on-site testing. So uh, everything was converging this uh, web software and visualized, uh, uh, which is operational, in a spatial map monitoring data of the Apulia region. So this system was a combination, again, of a different uh, approach together in order to set up something that could be efficient. Now, speaking about the Raymond sensing, on that time, uh, the only uh, available approach was to see symptoms. And uh, as I say, Olive, his primary host, was showing very nice, uh, clear symptoms, but it was also containing other problems. <laughs> That's uh, the, the main uh, difficulties. So we were uh, focusing the attention on the photo interpretation keys of different stages of this type of symptoms, relief scorching on the canopy and using the photo interpretation of uh, high-resolution aerial images, we uh, selected uh, some photograms, uh, and uh, these photograms were uh, um, processed in uh, near-infrared, and uh, the trees which we photo interpreted, uh, this is uh, as, um, also was an activity between uh, uh, research, but in the same time, because of the emergency, was also a monitoring approach, the operational approach. So we monitored 450, we photo interpreted 450 trees, uh, which was about 13,000 hectares. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, photograms uh, were processed in our GIS uh, environment. And uh, so just to give you the idea, on that time, this is where the demarcation of the area, so uh, this is uh, uh, this is the blue. It was the is the was the buffer <laughs> because now the buffer is much high, higher. And so these are the two photograms. They were um, uh, mosaic of photograms that were uh, considered for this uh, study, and uh, uh, we could uh, uh, just evaluate uh, by the photo interpretation in this buffer and containment area, uh, going in the, in the field and inspecting the trees, uh, the percentage of trees showing uh, OQDS, I mean olive quick decline, and uh, trees which were showing olive quick decline, but they were found also infected by testing uh, in the laboratory. So uh, doing this approach, and uh, we selected, uh, um, sorry, uh, doing this approach, uh, we um, we did uh, uh, yes, uh, we uh, have a photo interpreted as I said, uh, 450,000 trees, but uh, um, around 26,000 were photo interpreted as uh, OQ showing OQDS like symptoms, and um, and then uh, uh, these trees uh, we could. Uh, thanks to the application XILAP, we could go in the field and find and inspect directly in the field. And uh, well, we found, of course, uh, that 64% uh, uh, by inspectors could be OQDS, I mean, associated to Xylella, but the rest uh, was due to other problems, biotic stress, prune pl um, plants, uh, etc. And uh, so these were the other problems, mainly also biotic stress uh, as anthracnose, verticillium, etc. So we um, decided to select uh, uh, three regional uh, of interest, regional of interest for uh, going in details uh, and evaluating uh, the OQDS trees and the not OQDS trees, but also the infection. So uh, in these trees, we found uh, that uh, uh, all trees were uh, found were photo interpreted as OQDS, but in reality, the green only were OQDS; the other one were not. Were due to other problems, and uh, we found so 15, more 60 percent in the first row, sec, uh, around 63 percent in the third, and 70 percent in the second, and 70 percent in the third. And uh, what is uh, interesting now uh, to see 
um, the infected trees, among these uh, Ocudias trees, how many were infected? And we found 3.5% in this ROI and 12% in this one and nothing in this one. And uh, uh, so we, uh, doing the monitoring, official monitoring separated, we try now to combine the, the data from the official monitoring in this area and uh, our photo interpretation and our results as infection. And uh, we found uh, that uh, uh, the correlation of infection, the, the triangle here and the square here, were always combining. And uh, so uh, at least uh, uh, what is the, the meaning of this? Uh, that, okay, I didn't find uh, that all of the Ocudias um, you know, infected expected trees were uh, infected, but at least I expected the sites which contain the infection. So anyway, the, the purpose was to guide the um, inspectors to survey the areas as a priority uh, to investigate because there is something, some problems, which may likely be the, uh, the xylella, associated to xylella. So, uh, just to conclude, uh, we say that 64% of the photo interpreted trees, we are speaking about 500,000, were Ocudia suspected, and uh, the remaining was, uh, 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 was associated to other uh, purpose, or other reason, and, um, and then we found uh, in, the, uh, in the area that we uh, photo interpreted, we found uh, the infection, which was also confirmed by official monitoring, and uh, if we went in the buffer area around and isolated the photo, we found also 20% of ELISA positive trees, um, in reality, there was no need to differentiate, which is an additional work, the three phototypes. We need to say if it's infected or not, is, it, is, or is uh, the photo interpretation is occurred, yes or not, just to speed up also the photo interpretation procedure. And the application XILAP facilitates a lot the finding of the trees for inspection. We also made a sort of evaluation by economical point of view that uh, uh, 450,000 trees, which is around 13,000 hectares, uh, we could uh, find that these were photo interpreted as uh, uh, trees suspected, or could yes, and uh, we sampled, inspect, and then we found that uh, some of these trees were infected. So in reality, this work which guided the survey in the field uh, doesn't cost really a lot. It's a very simple technique. And what is amazing that these auto images are available in the region. You don't have to buy because they have an annual acquisition of this image for other purposes. So the cost, which is the, the high cost, in reality is for something that can be shared for many purposes in the uh, service. So uh, we use, for example, those ones used for uh, fire, and so um, in this uh, we need only two technicians for inspection and one technician for, uh, uh, for two months for to photo interpretation. It can be done, of course, in the, before the survey of time. So it was a, a considered about a cost of two, three euro per hectare. And as I say, this cost could be reduced because of the image cost, which is not only for plant health. And um, so, as I say, this was uh, the approach for uh, emergency for provide soon tools. But of course, research is going on for being more precise, early detect, as uh, Peter said before. I mean, try to be more accurate because we can be more accurate. So, in uh, as uh, Peter showed already, there is an approach uh, in uh, being done in Pont and X factors already in this way. And in X factors, we are also doing the approach of spectral discrimination of CF infection, Xylella fastidiosa, and also infections induced that very similar to uh, by other uh, pathogens. In this case, we have a trachomycotic fungi in olive trees, which may really interfere in the symptomatic uh, expression. And uh, identification, now to be precise, we are working on identification of plant secondary metabolite associated to the infection and correlation with the spectral wavelengths in order to find a specific package of wavelengths because we found out that the secondary metabolites are very specific to the infection 
And uh, so the wavelength uh, lengths uh, that are associated to that uh, met second metabolite indirectly is also um, specific for that infection. And then, of course, uh, in the X-Factor project, we also are developing the application because all these tools, IT, GIS, uh, and remote sensing, uh, work together, and uh, an automatic recounting also for, uh, for the olive trees in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think that was an excellent uh, talk again. I think uh, we've had a lot of uh, very good talks this morning. I thank all the speakers for their impeccable timing. I think we've done very well this morning. So I think we should uh, break for coffee just now. Um, I will try to bring you back in for 10 past again, as, as we've said on the program. So we have 25 minutes for, for coffee, um, and we'll continue with the next talk and then the discussion. The coffee is just outside. Just outside. <laughs>